Welcome to the Chaparral, California's most extensive ecosystem. It's in every single county in the state. And if you'll notice in this picture, there are a lot of shrubs, but there's a lot of what? Not missing shrubs, but there's a lot of something missing, which is trees. <laughs> there's not a lot of trees in the Chaparral. In fact, if you take a look at the state map, you'll notice that Chaparral is in every single county in the state. So cue the map. Thanks. Chaparral is important because it really defines California's uh, nature in so many different ways. Um, and I, before I start today, I want to uh, apologize. I used to be a serial lecturer, but I've reformed quite a bit. <laughs> and what I found was lecturing is probably the worst possible way to learn. So we're going to do some engaging things in this presentation, so I hope you're ready for that. You ready? All right, so first of all, chaparral is an important word. And all of you have important words that has to do with your name. So right now, I want you all to shout your first name as loud as you can. <laughs> okay, that was not very uniform. Let's try it again. <laughs> okay, those are beautiful names, right? Do you love your name? Yes, okay, it identifies you. It tells you who you are. Um, and chaparral is the same way. Unfortunately, what if somebody called all of you stubby, for example? I mean, how would you feel? Right, okay, so... Chaparral is the same problem. Most people don't know what it is. They call it stubby shrublands or weeds or grass. It's not a Western TV show. It's not a plant. It's not a health food item that you can buy in the uh, health food stores. It's actually a very important ecosystem. So let's see if we can figure out by starting, first of all, if we know how to spell the thing. How many P's in Chaparral? How many R's? Okay, let's check our spelling. Okay, one P, two R's. All right, so let's get a little uh, physical here. I want you all to stand up. Stand up. I want you to put your branches out. Don't hit your friends next to you or the tree next to you. Okay, look around. Look around. So if you had to define this particular ecosystem, where do you think it would be? Forests? Forests? Where? Forests? There's forests other than Brazil, you know. <laughs> okay, sit down. Okay, so take your little limbs, and I want you to get really crunchy, and maybe get really close to the person next to you. You might want to ask first. Okay, look around. Look around. What kind of ecosystem are you in now? Come on, think about it. What are we talking about today? Chaparral, okay? So typically, at this juncture... At this juncture, I ask you to do the next terrestrial ecosystem, and I'm not going to make you do this, but I will. Where am I now? Okay, we got forests. We, yes, forest, chaparral, grasslands, right? So the chaparral is not a forest, it's not a grassland, it's a native shrubland, and it's California's most distinctive native habitat. You got that straight? Okay, good. So I just want you to understand, first of all, um, Chaparral was not something I knew about not too long ago. I found out about it when a sycamore leaf visited my classroom at Sarah High School. So Sarah High School, in case you know where it is, it's kind of one of those climate-controlled schools. There's no windows in the classrooms for the most part, and the only way you get outside is going through a hallway, so most classrooms don't have an exit outside, except my classroom did. It went out to the garden, which, of course, uh, wasn't used very well, but... Anyway, that's beside the point. And what I would do is I always prop the door open every, every morning to let the sunshine in because I was teaching biology, by the way, high school biology, and I thought at least that's what you want to be feeling, right, the environment? Well, I remember distinctly one November morning. It was one of those Santa Ana wind days, really hot, crisp. Your lips are feeling kind of crunchy. And I was giving one of these brilliant lectures, as I always did, on photosynthesis, and I was rambling on about photons and coenzymes. Everybody was paying attention. And I noticed in the corner, this sycamore leaf blew in, spinning on the linoleum floor. And I stood there with my lecture notes, and as, of course, any good teacher would do if you saw this kind of thing, I stopped. Nobody noticed, I don't think. And I thought to myself, what am I teaching biology for in a classroom? I've got the door open. <laughs> that just doesn't cut it. So I dropped my notes, and I said, we're out of here. Everyone's you know, a little <laughs> nervous about what's happening. So I got everybody up. We went out into the sunshine. It was quite a shock. And we ended up at this little edge of the parking lot where there's a canyon. 
So I took my 36 students without permission slips or a plan, and we went down into the canyon between the shrubs and the trees. And we proceeded to find so much fun down there. There was a few angry people, but for the most part, there was a lot of laughter. So what we did was we eventually built this mile, mile and a half long trail that looped around the whole area down there through the stream. And we found out by getting lost in nature and exposing ourselves to it, we found ourselves. It was so much fun to learn about the other life out there, to be connected with it. And something else we found, which was interesting, and that is nature doesn't care what you look like, how much weight you've lost or not, <laughs> your haircut, your, your makeup, what you're wearing, whether you're famous or not, it doesn't care. It allows you to be who you want to be, which may account for the fact that uh, most of my friends in high school and junior high were insects and birds, but that's another story. So the chaparral is a really important place, and, and we learned a lot of things about it. So what I want to do is share some of those things to you. There's three basic stories we learned out of many. One had to do with climate, another one with fire, and the third one has to do with biodiversity. So what I want to talk about first is, is fire. Chaparral has an incredibly delicate relationship to fire. And most people think chaparral needs to burn. It's, it's one of those things that has to happen all the time. Well, that's not true. The natural fire return interval for chaparral is anywhere between 30 to 150 years. And the kind of fire that's in chaparral is not the type of fire most people think is natural. There's two kinds of fire in nature. There's little surface fires. Everybody kind of do this. You're not doing? OK, good. Make that little fire noise. Okay, in some forests, when the lightning strikes, that's the kind of fire that goes through. It burns some of the shrubs, the pine needles. It doesn't really get up into the trees. That's not what happens in chaparral, as you'll notice. When chaparral comes through, the whole system burns. It's a catastrophic, horrible event, right? No. <laughs> this is the way it's supposed to be. Chaparral doesn't have little surface fires. It has what you call crown fires. Okay, you ready for this? Hands up. And make a big noise. Go. <laughs> Right? That's a crown fire. It's hot, intense, huge. The bigger, the hotter, the better. And so chaparral, that's its normal pattern. But it can happen too frequently, because if it does, as you can see in the next picture, what happens if there's too much fire, you can actually eliminate chaparral. This whole area got burned in 1970. The middle section got burned in 2001. And the little corner there got burned, burned in 2003. And what you'll notice, the corner area, there's only two years difference between the last fire. There's not enough time for the chaparral to recover. There's not enough seeds that have been restocked into the soil. The little uh, underground root burls don't have enough starch to recover and re-sprout. And so eventually what happens is chaparral gets returned to sort of this weird mix of, of just either bare ground or weeds. And weeds, ironically, they're mostly non-native invasives. They show up and they make the system more flammable. In fact, they make it more flammable to the point where it can only almost burn every single year. So it's more flammable than the chaparral. And this is happening throughout Southern California, and it's heading north. So this is one of the crises we're dealing with with this ecosystem. It has a relationship with fire, but it's got to be the right, right relationship, if that makes sense. Okay, the next story has to do with a really uh, interesting part of chaparral, and that has to do with biodiversity. And biodiversity, cue next slide, thank you, has to do with the plants and the animals there. So this is manzanita. Manzanita, it's a, it's a Spanish word for little apple. And manzanita is really the characteristic shrub of, of the chaparral. But the story isn't just because it's beautiful and that kind of thing. What's interesting about it is that there's little animals that make this thing possible. So the little animals are little rodents and bunnies and that kind of thing. And what they like to do is they like to collect the seeds and bury them. And this is really important because when the fire comes through, if the seeds are on the surface, they're going to burn up, right? These little guys cache them. And when the fire comes through, and the heat doesn't penetrate the soil, but just gets enough of the chemical from the heat into the soil to stimulate the germination of the seeds, the seeds come up. And so the little animals take these seeds, bury them just deep enough so when the fire comes through, it's not too hot to destroy them, but it's just close enough to the soil surface to allow for the chemicals in the smoke or the charred wood to stimulate germination. But if all these little rodents remembered everything, guess what would happen? There wouldn't be any seeds. They'd go back and eat them all. So this creature here, the rattlesnake, the gopher snake, hawks, the predators are very, very important to protect the manzanita. So there's a wonderful story about manzanita out there that has to do with rattlesnakes. 
What does rattlesnakes and ant man's need to have to do to, with each other? Now you know, it's all intimately connected. There's also an interesting little bird called a wren tit. And uh, you may know this, there's a lot of tits in the chaparral. There's bush tits, wren tits, tit mice. And this particular tit has a wonderful little song. It sounds like a bouncing ping pong ball. At least it doesn't sound like it, but it has that same rhythm. And we're going to try that. It kind of goes like this. See if you've ever heard this before. Have you heard that before? Okay, we're going to do this together. Now look, if you can't whistle, I want you to hum. And if you don't do it, I'm going to make you come up here by yourself and do it. Are you ready? Not yet. Hang on, hang on. One, two, three. That's great. You probably get a mate pretty easily. That's good. So these little creatures, they, they mate for life. They last about 10 years. And they have territories about an acre, acre and a half. And they really define the chaparral in terms of its voice. The next animal is something that's on the state flag. And this particular canyon you see here happens to be the place where the last grizzly bear in Southern California was killed in 1908. And there she is. We don't know what ecological role the California grizzly bear had in the chaparral, but we do know it must have been important. They roamed in packs of up to 10. They'd go down to the beach and eat a, eat, eat a, eat a beached whale, come back and terrorize the Native Americans, go up on a hill and eat some manzanita berries. They really dominated this region. Now they're gone. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a sign and a symbol to us to make sure that doesn't happen to any other animals. And it's on the state flag every single day to remind us. The next thing that's important in the chaparral in terms of biodiversity is not just the plants and the animals, but the soil upon which it grows. This green rock right here, I don't know if you're familiar with it, this is on the top of Black Mountain, which is right out our door here, and Double Peak. This is andesite. Andesite is a volcanic rock. Both those mountains used to be tremendously violent, huge volcanoes. Off the coast, five miles. And as the plates have moved around, they came on shore. But you know, to be able to look out your door, drive by Black Mountain and say, that was really, that was really a volcano. I mean, tell your friends this. I mean, it's fascinating. And the rocks that these areas produce are just really, well, they're rocky. And there's not a lot of soil nutrients in it. And so the chaparral grows in these nutrient-poor soils because it's adapted to it and other plants aren't. So that's why chaparral is so common in these lousy soils. And I don't know about you, but when you, when you learn about your environment, all the new little friends that you meet, the soil under your... I don't know how anybody has any fun without passing Black Mountain and knowing it's a volcano. How many of you knew that? Have you been having fun lately? Well, now you will. And the important thing is, once you learn about where you live, it makes life so much more interesting. But the, the, the message I want to get across is the stories out there, you don't need to be a biologist to really understand and, and enjoy this stuff. There's wonderful stories out there in the simplest little things. For example, there's sunflowers out there. Now, I don't know if you know this, but this is not a, this is not a flower. This is a bouquet. And this is kind of a date tip for those of you that are interested in that kind of thing. I love you. I love you not. I love you. You know that whole thing? I'm going to stop it. I love you. I'm going to take all these little things off. These petals, right? No. Those are individual flowers. They're called ray flowers. They're not petals. They're individual flowers. And what's really cool about a sunflower is once you've taken off the I love you as a living knots, and I want you to do this today before you get home or find some neighbor's yard that you can probably steal one of the flowers in. And take this central part, this is called a disc, and squeeze it like that. And what you'll notice coming out are dozens of other little flowers, individual flowers that are the things that make all those poofy things on a dandelion. So this is not a flower, this is a bouquet. So on your next date, I want you to offer your date, whoever he or she is and offer them a bouquet, and you will immediately determine whether they're worth keeping or not. <laughs> because if they enjoy, they enjoy and understand it, then keep them. So the thing about getting lost in nature and, and, and learning to find yourself is that you, you go outdoors every day and you meet new friends or you get reacquainted with old ones. And it's a wonderful way to be. You become connected to the landscape and you're never bored again, because there's always something new out there. And so the essence of all of this is to get in touch with 
who you are, where you are, and to get lost in nature. And that's what's important because once you're lost in nature, you find yourself in a sense that you can't find yourself any other way. And so the place you can do that in Chaparral is everywhere. And one of the things I have done is I don't want to stop there, and you shouldn't either. When you become inspired about something in nature, I want you to spread your inspiration to other people. And I kind of do this too because I don't want it to stop there. I want that person to pass on that little inspiration. So I came up with this little silly gizmo. It's a green marble. So I hand these out all the time. And I get people all excited about nature. And I say, okay, here's a little gift for you. But I don't want you to keep it. It's just on loan. I want you to go out and share your enthusiasm for the natural environment and give it to somebody else and tell them to do the same thing. Because nature needs advocates. Because without advocates, no one's going to have a voice for the animals and the plants out there. And you're the ones that can do that. And the place you want to get lost in, the, in, in California nature is, is the chaparral.